everybody. We're going to do a little video here. Uh, 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 I'm Chris Coyer, and I'm joined by David Wells. Hey, David. Hello, everybody. Thanks for having me, Chris. Excited yeah, to be here. So, heck yeah. Um, David, you're at Netlify, right? I am indeed. Working over at Netlify. Super cool. Probably one of the coolest companies out there if you ask me but so we we teamed up because we thought we had this idea of you know i've been i don't know writing and learning and wrapping my head around all this serverless stuff lately and uh serverless well, it ends up jiving pretty well with what netlify does kind of static without limits and we'll get into all that but we thought maybe we'd like ask the world if they have any questions about serverless and then use some of those questions and also just talk about serverless a whole bunch in a series of videos that's this one so <laughs> david even made a little netlify site to ask y'all uh what your questions were and even that's kind of powered by some sort of serverless technology but uh, uh, so recently, I've been talking about it. I did this whole presentation uh, called the All-Powerful Front-End Developer that I delivered at some conferences that was kind of about serverless technology and how excited I was that it extends some of the serverless technology, extends what front-end developers are able to do in pretty exciting ways, kind of unlocks some doors, or I think the metaphor I use is it kicks over some roadblocks that would normally be there for the front end developer skill set. And, and David's got a wonderful talk, why serverless architecture is changing software development. So we've kind of been on the same page. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. I've been, you know, like pretty deep in the serverless world for a, a little over two years. Um, yeah. When I, when I first heard about it, uh, it kind of blew my mind because yeah, I was trying to set up like all these Docker containers and trying to figure out how to scale an, an app that I was building. And just kind of the whole serverless paradigm, which we'll get into, like really opened up some doors for me. Um, and I think the video that you made of how this gives front end dev superpowers is like dead on. <laughs> well, it's, it, that's nice to hear because you're the expert here and you actually can, you know, write serverless code and understand it all in a deeper way. And I'm just like, cool, neat. <laughs> uh, but hopefully I can uh, kind of help, um, I don't know, guide this and, and, and stuff and, and we'll learn. So this first video is just what the heck is serverless. David, if you had 15 seconds, what is it? Or, or what, like the, your shortest possible pitch for what the heck serverless is? Yeah, sure. So serverless in a nutshell is uh, just running your, your code on uh, a cloud of your choice, AWS, Azure, etc. cetera. Um, and it's paper execution. The so cloud, you only, huh? Yeah, the cloud. And the cloud. so it's paper execution, unlike traditional server models where you pay like monthly for the box and it'll scale for you. So a lot of the things that you have to deal with when you're actually running code on your own servers that you maintain a lot of that stuff gets taken away from the developer and you can really just write your application. Nice. Good. That's, pitch. that's the, yeah, that's the 15 second one. There's, <laughs> I have a much longer one, but. Oh, I'm sure there's a two hour one as well there. So, but so I, I like, we always got to tackle this and I feel like maybe two years from now we'll start, stop having to do it. But, but for now people are always like serverless. Aren't there still servers? There's still servers. Like that, what that sentiment that that it's not like it's not like these codes totally means that you're writing code that doesn't execute on the server. Because I would think it maybe the first time ever you hear the word, you're like, oh, they must be talking about like web workers or something, in which that you're executing code that never goes to a server, it stays on the client, like runs in the browser. That's kind of not what we're talking about. Yeah, it's it is like you mentioned, kind of a misnomer. Of course, there's servers somewhere. But again, they're yeah. abstracted away from the developer. It's very similar to like wireless internet, right? Somewhere in your house, there's a router attached to a wire. It's just kind of abstracted away from you. You don't have to think about it. Yeah. Um, and likewise, I'd also say, you know, you mentioned the cloud. Is the cloud actually a cloud or is it <laughs> machines running somewhere? So sure. the, the, yeah. Yeah, we're familiar with the cloud, right? The cloud is a bunch of servers in the sky that other people manage and maintain and scale and all that stuff for you. We're just taking advantage of that with serverless technology. We're not spinning up our own servers. And I spin up my own servers all the time for stuff. Like I run CSS tricks. I work on CodePen. I have a podcast shop talk show. All those websites are servers that I bought and literally pay monthly for to run. 
Uh, so the, I think people are familiar with that model. You pay for a server, or you put stuff on it and run the server. Serverless is, is, is not that. I don't have to buy the server. I don't pay monthly for it. But I ask of server stuff from it's other people's servers. And yeah. I think what's kind of cool about that is that it, it, I don't have to worry about all the stuff that I normally would have to worry about. You've mentioned scaling. I don't worry about scaling, right? I, yep. I just don't have to at all. Yep. So if you, you know, like let's say you build an application and it hits on Hacker News or it's featured on the front page of New York Times. Uh, I hope so. You know, if you're, you know, running on a single like node server, let's say like that, that simply won't scale with the amount of influx of traffic that you're going to get. Um, but if you're running that same API in a serverless function in something like AWS Lambda, um, you don't really need to worry about that. That load, load balancing is taken care of um, as well as That's like... That's so out far outside of my skill set. I yeah. have no idea how to scale a server, but I might want to use one because I want to build websites because I'm a front-end developer. So scaling is gone. Um, uh, what, could we put into the bucket like, like cheaper? Is that always the case? Yeah, so uh, because you're only paying for like the millisecond execution time, uh, it can be like astronomically cheaper. Um, like I ported over probably 12 of my personal projects that were running in digital ocean um, droplets yeah. okay. into uh, serverless functions. And I'm actually like well under the free tier of what oh, nice. a, uh, Lambda like gives you. So I basically went from paying like 120 bucks a month or whatever it was to zero. Uh huh. Um, but yeah, it it can uh, like drive some some cost savings for sure. As well as like because you're writing your code in smaller uh, basically functions, following kind of that Unix philosophy of like do one thing and do it well. Um, it's much easier to build um, more things with fewer developers, right? It's no longer do you have to like kind of coordinate across teams or like hey. DevOps, can you set up my ser this server and make sure it's, you know, the security's patched, there's a load balancer, yeah. there's database replicas, all that, all that stuff that, like, if you're building something that's going to get a lot of traffic, you need to do. Um, you really don't really, uh, yeah, you don't need to kind of think about those things um, until much And if you're a front-end developer, isn't it, I mean, front-end development alone is such a massive skill set that to add DevOps to that seems. Yep. So, so there is, you know, going into like the serverless world, it doesn't mean there's no DevOps. You still want to like monitor your functions and make sure like, uh, you know, your database isn't like being slow and all this other stuff, but it's, it's far less than what it used to be. Um, and it's kind of shifting, it's shifting that DevOps like kind of mindset into the front end as well. Like if you build it, you run it. Um, and in this case, the provider like AWS is, is running that code for you. Um, so you can kind of sleep easy at night and actually have Lambda functions trigger, like sending you alerts of like, hey, you know, something might be wrong with this thing or that thing. Um, so you can okay. actually okay. kind of stitch those things together. We'll talk about that in a future video though. Absolutely. We're kind of trying to define what serverless is and, and why it matters. So for, first of all, to, to back up just a second, I think you know, we're, we're talking about using other people's servers and how we don't have to worry about scaling and it can be so cheaper and you don't need as much traditional DevOps kind of thing. There's also like security stuff that, you know, that might fall into that bucket that you don't have to worry so much about because it's kind of not your server and it's more isolated anyway. But what are we talking about? And I think a, a term to define that's a very big deal that's a part of this, we're talking about cloud functions, um, or what is what? What else do they call them? Like functions cloud. as a service? Yep. So cloud functions or FAS. Um, yeah. FAS. Sure. Someone was saying it was like logic as a service as well. There's a good Hacker News thread recently. Uh, like, really? On er, yeah. It, it, every time there's you know someone talking about serverless on Twitter or on Hacker News, there's always that you know it goes back to the misnomer of like, well, there's servers somewhere. Uh, but it, yeah, again, that's not the point. It's yeah, it really isn't. That's the, yeah. that's a tired conversation which we're, we're bored of having. So, okay, so th that's what we're talking about. Um, cloud functions and all this ability, uh, you know, these other things. And there's caveats to all of it, which we'll get into. So we've defined what serverless is at least 
this major ingredient of serverless, which are these cloud functions, and and and, and soon we'll get into what you know, how, actually using them. But now, but b- before we stop this video, let's talk about actual use cases for it. You know, uh, that seems like a relevant thing to do. Yeah. So sure. why, why would I do it? Because it's not perfect for everything. It probably isn't super perfect for my like traditional WordPress site that I'm just running. Not that we couldn't use. Serverless for some interesting things, but like, what are more, you know, what what's like, quote unquote, a traditional use case for serverless? Yeah, sure. So huge use case is uh, using it for web and backend or web and mobile APIs. So like, instead of, let's say, you know, you have some custom functionality on your WordPress site, um, and yeah. it's going to get a lot of traffic, uh, you might not want to be hammering that WordPress database. Uh, because it could take down other parts of your site. So sure. running that through, um, you know, API gateway, tucking the Lambda, and then whatever data store that you want on the back end. In this, in this diagram you're showing here, it's DynamoDB. Yeah, um, you put these together in a presentation you had, and I thought they were great, because we can imagine this, like we have a front end of our site. It's a website or a mobile site or whatever, and we, the ultimate goal is to get some data in and out of a database, which is far on the other side there. But how do you communicate with that database? Well, there's going to be API keys, and there's going to be, all, you, know, you, you kind of need a server to do that. But if we're living in this serverless world, or if we're hosting our website on something like Netlify that doesn't have a, a server right there to talk to, we're going to have to do that through URLs, essentially. So yeah. these lambdas are kind of URLs that we're talking back and forth, which are talking to DynamoDB in this case, which is just an example of a data store. Yep, exactly. So yeah, the, the ideal scenario is like the front end of your, your website, your, your app is actually serving static from a CDN. So it's super fast and secure. That's what we're preaching over at Netlify. Uh, yeah. And then you're just calling into your, your backend API, which is, are, are just simply functions, those URLs. And because like with a static website, you can't put um, you know, secrets or API keys like if I was using Stripe or, or MailChimp to send emails or whatever. Like we can't yeah. put that in the front end of our site because you know, those bad script kitties are going to take it and then you know, rack up our bill. Uh, or worse. So let me, well, I got to paint the picture here one more time for my own brain to soak it in. So part of the reason why we'd use a cloud function to, to talk to our data store back and forth is because we don't have a server because we're, we want to use something like Netlify to host our site, a static file host. So yep. on Netlify, you just think of like all, all that the, Netlify is hosting for me is like CSS, HTML and JavaScript files, just flat files. There's no PHP here. There's no Node here. There's no Ruby. There's no Python. There's nothing. It's just like a CDN of static files. And so like, but we chose that on purpose. We're not like, Netlify isn't like weak hosting because it doesn't have those things. It doesn't have those things on purpose because it makes them smoking fast and it makes them really secure and it opens up all these like nice deployment workflows and Git integration and all this cool stuff. So we're, bu- we're building the site on purpose with a host like Netlify because that's so, there's so many advantages to it, but it, that doesn't limit us. It doesn't mean, oh, just because we don't have node right here on this server doesn't mean we can't use any node at all. It means that we're just going to have to talk to node through URLs, through our client side JavaScript. And yeah. because we can do that, now we can also pull data from databases, write data to databases, do authentication, do all this stuff that we'd expect to do. It's just we're doing it kind of off-site through serverless technology. Exactly, exactly. So, yeah, it's having that static front end and then in, like, anything dynamic that you need to do, even if it's, like, dynamically rendering out routes, like, you can yeah. do that through a function as well. So, like... The, the idea that like a static website is kind of like, oh, that's, you know, 1990s web tech, right? Uh, it's, it's coming back in a big Heck way. Yeah, it is. <laughs> um, and there's, there's reasons for that. And serverless is a huge piece of that. <laughs> and then serverless unlocks powers. Um, so w- what are some other po- use cases here? So sure. So you can, um, you know, run cron jobs. So like scheduled tasks in a serverless function. So like, oh, I want to, you know, check my favorite sports team website once a day and grab the stats and, you know, send myself an email about them uh, as a silly example. Uh, 
Another and huge cheap, right? Because Cron yeah. only hits hits a function once an hour or what, once every period of time. Why spin up a server that you pay for for a hundred percent of the time when I could spin it up when I can pay per execution? Yeah, that's yeah, that's a that's a really good point. It's you know if you're paying monthly for that box, like you know the cheapest server you can kind of get is like eight bucks a month, right? Why would you pay eight bucks a month for a silly little app like that? when it's, it would literally be free on any one of the major like hosting providers. So, um, so, so then you can like kind of set up all kinds of crons, do home automation or automate stuff at your, at, during, like, at your day job or do whatever you want really. It kind of opens up that world and you don't have to talk to you know, the person in charge of like you know, setting up servers in your company to do it. You can just uh, toss up a, a Lambda function, it'll sit there idly until it's called and you're only nice. billed for that millisecond execution. So is that nice. another another really big one that I, I really like doing is webhook listeners. It's very similar to the cron use case where it's like, all right, so if there's a new GitHub pull request on my repo and I wanna trigger some custom logic or like test something on the code or do something like that, I can just set up a, a listener with that Lambda function, yeah. run my custom logic and do whatever I want with it. Yeah. A lot of the different third-party, um, you know, software as a service solutions out there offer webhooks as a as a means of communicating between one another. That's nice, yeah. It all comes back to this URL thing to me. That's so cool. All these cloud functions that you make, they have a URL, and you hit the URL, and it runs the code. So it, it's, that's kind of what a webhook is in a way. I also think of Slack a bit, though, because the Slack has cool APIs that they think in all their data or, or documentation is in webhooks. If you want to send a message to a Slack channel, they have a webhook. You hit th their URL. So in this case, you know, your cloud func you'd hit your own cloud function that has all your API or uh, API keys and stuff in it and then hit their webhook and it's like a two-step process, but now you you kind of that's is how you build a, a Slack app. Yep. If you're building a Slack app, a great way to do it would be a serverless function. Exactly. And, and like, I'm sure a lot of folks are familiar with uh, Zapier, right? So Zapier has a webhook, um, you know, trigger or, or destination where if there's not a, the, the Zapier thing that you want, you can just ping that webhook to trigger your Lambda function and do whatever custom logic you want. So now like you can kind of extend Zapier in any which way that you might want. So there's, nice. There's just, That's funny to think about extending Zapier because Zapier is all about extending everything else that you right, have. Right, right. Yeah, you know, the world really is at your fingertips here. So, okay, maybe just a few more because it, it, it kind of like its use cases are almost weird to talk about with cloud functions because it's anything, uh, as you said at one point, because I think there's a cap on it for these services. And when we're talking about services, we're talking about we're talking about AWS Lambda. We're talking about Azure functions. There's a number of providers for these, so we're on purpose talking about it a bit abstractly. But pretty much all of them cap it at, you can run your cloud function if you'd like. It stops at five minutes, though. We, you, yeah. We're not going to let you run hour-long things or whatever. Yeah, so the hard limit right now is five minutes. So if you have, if your function or, or server-side code is running something that takes longer than five minutes, which, like, I personally have never written any code that, like, takes more than five minutes to process the request. Yeah, that's um, quite, quite a lot, yeah. But if you're doing some like heavy machine learning stuff or like, yeah, huge batch jobs, and yeah, there's, there's some things that don't really fit into that world or might be actually like far more expensive because you're just running this function like for a super long time. Um, Speaking of though, maybe we'll just do this one real quick that Luke wrote in saying like, what about like spinning up your own Docker and putting that somewhere like isn't that like how does this compare to that? That seems like interesting new technology as well. So maybe would the answer be if your thing is running longer than five minutes, then maybe that's the route you should go. Yeah, exactly. So if you're um, yeah, if you're gonna be running something for longer than five minutes, or another another use case that it is doable in serverless functions, but it's a little weird uh, is web sockets. Because WebSockets, you make that connection, then you pick, like talk back and forth like consistently through that connection. Yeah. If it if it takes longer than five minutes, it's going to kill that connection. So like that would be another mm -hmm. instance where you'd want to set up your own, uh, you know, Node server in a Docker container, sure. and Socket IO, or whatever you're using. I see. That just kind of runs all the time. Yeah. Um, 
Okay, some of my favorites are, for example, let's say I'm a front end developer and I want to integrate some kind of like SMS sending into the into the website I'm building. Like, uh, you know, I used the example before of a recipe website, and you can you know send the recipe right from the website right to yourself on your phone. Uh, well, that's perfect use case for Twilio. Twilio has Node APIs to do this, so I think this is great. This is what this is what I'm talking about: pushing that roadblock back for front end developers. Normally, I'd be like, I don't know how to send an SMS message. I have no idea. I don't want to spin up that server. I don't want to be responsible for that whole world. But knowing that I can run a cloud function, I could basically just be like, hmm, this is how you do it, huh? Copy node code from Twilio, you mm-hmm. know, paste it into a cloud function, you know, put my API keys in there. And all of a sudden, through basic JavaScript that I'm somewhat comfortable with, I'm using Twilio to have implemented this feature with no help, no DevOps, no worry about security, no worry about scaling and all this stuff. And I just think that's so powerful. And, and if you imagine, okay, oh, that's Twilio, you know, Stripe works the same way with payment requests, like Mailgun or SendGrid or all these things are the same, are the same as this, but for sending email. And you've just unlocked for yourself all these possibilities through cloud functions um, with just your front end developer skill set. Pretty cool. Yeah, I agree. And that, that this goes back to like the, the other kind of piece of serverless, which is like leveraging those third party services, right? It, yeah. If you're, if your business is, you know, you're building it, let's say, you know, I'm building a doggy dating app, you know, it's not really, it wouldn't make sense for your company to invest the time to build a transactional email service. Just use something like SendGrid uh, or MailChimp or whatever. And likewise, it doesn't make sense for your company to build out like a telecoms provider to send SMS messages, leverage something like Twilio or an AWS service called SNS. There's, there's plenty of things like they've done a lot of the heavy lifting and made, like, offer them up as services. So you yeah. can focus on your core competency, in this case, a doggy dating app, because that's what the world really needs. I uh, love this sentiment. Yeah, it does though. Like you don't, you know, you got to balance this out. When you're starting a business, you should be taking advantage of as much as you can that lets you focus on the core of your business and is cost effective in which to do that. And serverless functions being how usually how cheap they are, allow you to do that. Take advantage of what you can. It's just easier than ever these days to start a business. So maybe that's a good place to stop this one. We've kind of defined what serverless is and we didn't get into like, code and stuff and more advanced use cases and we'll talk about that in future videos so any final thoughts david um no that sounds good yeah just you know anything that you can write in node python java like whatever runtime that the function as a service provider uses like you can uh, you can run that through a serverless function so like i write everything in java doesn't have to be and node, node yeah, you like Node because front end, but it doesn't have to be exactly. And then, so I write all my code in Node. I write all my JavaScript on the front end in React, and I can use any npm module on the front end or the back end to basically like build out these kind of more robust applications without a lot of the overhead of the past. So I think it opens up that world of of possibilities, like you're saying, Chris. Possibilities. That's that's a you know if there's one big message here, I guess that that can be it. So, all right. Thanks everybody for listening. We'll uh, keep watching future videos where we dig into some code and stuff like that.